This is part two, uh, last week of the, where we said only Christians burn forever. And we've seen what that meant and that it is scripture. So when we have a heart that's on fire for the Lord and our lamps are full of oil, and throughout eternity that has to be, do you agree? It's not like we just do it here, we go to heaven, then that stuff doesn't exist no more. The Holy Spirit is still there. Christ is still there. And God is still there. And by his grace and mercy, we will be there. Amen? But if we want to be there, we need to be serious about our relationship with the Lord. We're living in a time that is uh, treacherous, to say the least. We've been blessed in this country for the most part with minimal... Um, attacks at this point in time, but we don't know what's coming. But my urgency has always been, are you ready to meet the Lord today? Last week, we talked about the wise and foolish virgins and the oil in their lamp, but we wanted to go deep to see. We understand that the oil represented the Holy Spirit, and the lamp uh, was what? And the light was what? So we look at that, but we look deeper because... In Colossians it, t or Colossians, it tells us that we need to have Christ in us. So do we agree that we, in order to be fit for heaven, we have to be safe to go to heaven? Do we agree with that? And so how are we to be made safe to go to heaven? The wise and foolish virgins, there's so many stories, but the whole gospel is truly into that parable. I believe it's one of the strongest parables the Lord could give us if we go a little bit out of the box with our thinking, uh, go a little deeper with the oil and what that oil represents. Because if I have to reflect Christ, then I need to be filled with Christ. Do you agree? I need to be filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit in order to, I can't give what I don't have. And so when we see that oil in the lamp, we see the presence of Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit in that parable when we trim our lamps, it's for what purpose? What was that, Dave? More to more light, a brighter light. That's why we do it. And so if we really look at the people in that parable, if we use today's terms, we could say they were all Christians because God was talking to the church. They were all nice people. Uh, they were tithe payers. They kept the Sabbath. Um, they looked good on the outside. Uh, and they liked being around people who did good things, and uh, they didn't have evil in their hearts. But there's one problem. One had the oil, the other did not have enough oil. One was satisfied with where they were at. The others obviously were never satisfied because they were continuing to fill their lamps with the oil. They saw their need. So my question for myself and you is, do we really see our need for what God is offering us? And are we willing to do what God has asked us to do? Are we willing to come out of our comfort zones? We have a lot of words, a lot of people will say what love is, and I love the Lord, and amen, hallelujah, and then nothing happens until next Sabbath we come to church for a couple, three hours. Um, but to be a disciple of Christ is a full-time uh, lifestyle. Do you agree with that? When we chose to be baptized and to understand Jesus and what he has done for us and we want to repent and now we want to start walking toward more light and turn our back to the darkness. So the oil and the foolish virgins, and we need to examine ourselves every day because a lot of people who think they're wise virgins are foolish virgins. That's why the Bible talks about being deceived and, and don't be deceived. And we need not be deceived. We need not be Laodicea. Uh, we choose to be complacent. We don't, uh, it's not something we're forced to do. Do you agree? We choose that. And Laodicea is not a good place for a Christian to be. We cannot be lukewarm and walk the fence. So with that said and done, we're going to go through some things, and hopefully today we will see love in a different. Uh, I'm so unfit to give a message about the love of God. But he sure laid it on my heart for a long time. Um, so by his grace, we'll get through. So let's have a prayer, and we'll go through and see what the love of God looks like. Heavenly Father, again, we come to your throne of grace and mercy. And we ask you to continue to fill this place with your Holy Spirit. There will be spiritual battles fought here today, Lord, so we need of all heaven 
to come among us, send your holy angels to fight off the distractions and the devil's work that he will attempt to do. And Father, we just need your illumination. Uh, my prayer is that each one of our hearts will be changed today in such a greater way that we would truly have a burden for souls and, and want to do something about it. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you were asked this question, what is love, how would you answer it? So we're going to look at a couple worldly definitions of love. Uh, one of them really um, entertained me when I seen it. I, I think it'll be the same way. It's amazing what people in the world think love is. So we'll look at that, and then we're going to go to the real love in the world, and that's uh, what Christ has for us. What does it mean to love God and God loves us? So love is defined in many ways. The word love has been cleverly twisted, perverted by Satan in so many ways that we misuse that word in so many ways. I'm guilty of that. You know, you'll see some of these, um, we use it generically, but God's love is not generic. <laughs> God's love is a serious, serious issue, um, and we'll see that. We use the word love when we really mean like or really like. The meaning of love has been watered down to a point where many are confused in what love is, really is. We definitely are in a society today as we're seeing the change in our culture, electronics, cell phones, all this kind of stuff. I mean, people, they'll text more than they talk to each other. And I don't know about you, uh, my loved ones that have passed on, um, my mom, um, I try hard to remember what her voice sounded like. You know, that's one of the things we tend to lose, what they sounded like. And to me, that's real important because I never want to forget the sound of that. But the Bible is the most remarkable book of love in the world. It record, <clears throat> records the greatest love story ever written. You agree? It is the greatest love story there ever was. Everything that God does is motivated by love, even though it looks bizarre at times. We do not understand it. We have all the evidence we need when we search the scriptures to know that God is not a liar. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. His promises are sure. The devil is the one who brings doubt and fear into us. That that's not into God's vocabulary. God does, his dictionary does not have doubt in it. Us as earthly parents, do we want our kids to doubt our love for them? Well, God doesn't want us to doubt his love for us either. But we need to understand his kind of love and put away what the worldly concept is. God's totally self-sacrificing, unconditional love for us who sent his son to die on the cross. And we read that in John, in 1 John. A love story that shows that Jesus was willing to give up his eternity to vindicate his father's character and for us to have eternal life. I mean, just dwell on those thoughts for a while. You're talking about the God of the universe. When we say he emptied heaven, he, he emptied heaven. He emptied all. We talked last week about Jesus, remember? And the same for us. We have to be prepared before the battle hits. We can't go into battle. Jesus won his victory on the cross when he was in the Garden of Yosemite. That's where he sweat blood. That's where he agonized with his father. And that's the first time recorded that his father did not talk back to him. But his father didn't forget he was there, did he? Because he sent angels to give him strength and uphold him. But Jesus was in such, taking the sins of the world upon him. Uh, we can't even comprehend and knowing that, it, not only that, losing that, he's going to soon be beaten. It's a wonder he didn't die being beaten. He was beaten to death, but the Lord had a prophecy that said he'll die on the cross. It's a love story where God risked all. If Jesus failed, think of this. He's the one thing that God could not recreate. God could not recreate Jesus. He can recreate us, trees, water, everything, and stars, pick a subject, but he could not re recreate Jesus. Now that, that should give us a little insight of the type of love that the Lord has for us and how much value he holds for us, even though we're filthy rags. He says, but you're, you're expensive rags. So man's thoughts on love, we'll go through a few of these. The dictionary.com defines love this way. A profoundly tender, passionate affection for another person, a feeling of warm personal attachment or deep affection. Sounds pretty good on the surface. As for a parent, child, or friend, sexual passion or desire, a person toward whom love is felt, 
Beloved person, sweetheart. Love is a mind that wishes others to be happy and free from suffering. We often confuse love as a relationship where we get something from someone else. Wikipedia has this to say about love. The English word love can refer to a variety of different feelings, states, and attitudes ranging from interpersonal affection, I love my mother, to pleasure, I love that meal. We've all said that, I'm sure. It can refer to an emotion of strong attraction and personal attachment. Love may be understood as part of the survival instinct, a function to keep human beings together against menaces and to facilitate the continuation of the species. A person can be said to love an object, principle, or goal if they value it greatly and are deeply committed to it. And again, it's a misread. We can say we understand that when we say we know that when I say, well, I, I love that meal, we know that we really meant I liked it. But the trouble is with a lot of things with Satan, he brings little things into our lives over time that we become desensitized. And then when we're desensitized, we don't no longer think of these things. We just say it as a matter of fact. And by doing so, <clears throat> we can do something wrong for so long that we think it's right. Uh, for an example, not a popular one, uh, probably Joe Cruz, if you remember his book, Creeping Compromise. But if I was to say to you, uh, I was having a party at my house and a bunch of people came over, for Bible study and uh, just to get together and someone showed up in their underclothes, we'd be appalled, right? Or if they came to church that way. Uh, and we teach about outward adornment and the importance of reflecting Christ and not ourselves and not trying to draw attention to ourselves. But if I color that, put a little padding and I call it a bikini and a bathing suit, all of a sudden we're all right with it, even though we're still starting to say we We've accepted that over time, that that's okay, so we can flaunt that way. Um, but it's not okay according to God. People can also love material objects, animals, or activities if they invest themselves in bonding or otherwise identifying with those things. This one, <laughs> you'll love this one. Uh, <laughs> this definition of love, um, as sad as it is, probably is true for a lot of younger people, not to pick on younger people, but when we're seeing all this dysfunction in homes and divorces and rough life and all these kind of things. But the Urban Dictionary, this is what they say love is. Love is nature's way of tricking people into reproducing. Now that's <laughs> crazy. The Free Dictionary says it's a feeling of intense desire and attraction toward a person with whom one is disposed to make a pair the emotion of sex and romance. An intense emotional attachment is for a pet or a treasured object. This one here, this shows, you know, God loves every one of us the same. Do you agree? Nobody has uh, any more uh, relationship than God than they want, but it, there's nothing we can do to make God love us more. Do you agree with that? Nothing we can do. He already loves us. But, and he doesn't have a social economic mentality like we tend to do uh, as earthly beings. We look at people, if somebody's homeless, and we look at somebody uh, that's an Einstein or whatever, and so we start forming little ideas of what we think they are in our head, and yet we're called to love them all the same as God did. This, uh, this is a highly educated person, and here's what she has to say about love. A leading researcher of positive emotions at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill presents scientific evidence to argue that love is not what we think it is. Now, this is great. We got scientific evidence to see love is not what we think it is. She goes, it's not a long-lasting, continually present emotion. Rather, it's what she calls a micro-moment of positivity resonance. She means that love is a connection characterized by a flood of positive emotions which you share with another person, any other person whom you happen to connect with in the course of your day. You can experience these micro-moments with your romantic partner, child, or close friend. 
And you can also fall in love, however momentarily, with less likely candidates, like a stranger on the street, a colleague at work, or an attendant at a grocery store. So I ask you, do these define the kind of love that God has for us? Do they define the type of love we have for God and each other? I hope the answer is, is, is no. Um, do we, I don't believe any human being um, can understand the depth of God's love for us, but we can understand enough to love him and know his grace and mercy and what he's done for us. And everybody in here has a story to tell what God has done for them. Everybody here has a past. I don't care if you were born in the church, fifth generation Adventist, newbie, whatever. We all have a story to tell about Jesus and what he's done for us. And it's all connected because of love. So are these the ways in which God loves us? There's one deceptive thread running through these thoughts on love that man defines. Because some of them look pretty good on the surface. We say, yeah, well, that's true. But although it may be hidden at first, if you look deep at it, you'll see it. It's a love that is self-focused and feeling-focused, not self-sacrificing, not unconditional. Is not that the love that God has for us? God's love is agape. And human words, we've, we try to express what agape love is. We, how do you describe something that you haven't seen the depth of, but you have to do it? God's love is unselfish. He's 100% self-sacrificing and unconditional. Do you all agree with that? We have to agree with this to go through the rest of this. He, he is self-sacrificing. He is a humble God. I don't know how many people think of God as being humble, but God is a humble God. You look at how much credit he gives to Jesus. Jesus gives the Father credit. The Holy Spirit gives Jesus. And it goes on and on through the scriptures. And because of his love, he gives us promises. Uh, he gives us great warnings. He does everything he can. And if you notice the Bible, I don't care if we... Uh, have a lower IQ or a high IQ. He has something in the Bible that everybody can understand when they're seeking it. There's no book in the world that can do that. We can have science books, and if you're not educated, you're going to be sitting there with a dictionary looking up every other word. But the Bible, by seeking the Holy Spirit, and in one of the attributes of the Holy Spirit, it says he will teach us all things. He will lead us into all truth. So it doesn't matter who or what you are. If that's your desire, uh, you can draw as close to God as you want. Agape is a Greek word for love, primarily a love of the will rather than emotions. Even though emotions are tied to love, it's, it's a matter of the will. How many people have done things, <clears throat> even in our weak love state, for somebody because we love them, uh, but it was something maybe we didn't want to do at the time, but uh, we did it because our will took over our emotions. The New Testament never speaks of God loving unbelieving human beings with emotional love or love which expects something in return. But he loves with his will, with agape. John 3.16, Romans 5.8. So God loves by his will. It's his nature to love, right? It's his character. That's what we all understand. Love is not only one of God's attributes, it's also an essential part of his nature. God is love. Love like this is everlasting in Jeremiah, it's free in Hosea, sacrificial in John, and enduring to the end. So look at that. God is love, everlasting, free, sacrificial, enduring. Which one do you want to leave out? Which one would you want to leave out as we're growing towards the Lord? Agape love indicates the nature of the love of God toward his beloved son, toward the human race generally, and toward those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Agape love conveys God's will to his children about their attitude toward one another. Now we're going to get a little more personal and, and see where we fall in this category. And when we're doing this, uh, let's just keep asking the Holy Spirit to really expose to us, am I a wise or foolish virgin? Because the greatest thing about being deceived is, one, we don't know it, and and, and we're told by an inspired pen, it's one of the toughest things to make people see because we think we're right. And that is a tough situation. We have to be humble. But God has a lot of ways of getting our attention. Love for one another was, was a proof to the world of true discipleship. 
Agape love also expresses the essential nature of God, 1 John. Love can be known only from the actions it prompts as seen in God's love and the gift of his Son. Love found its perfect expression in the Lord Jesus. Christian love is the fruit of the Spirit of Jesus in the believer. So how do we get this love and how do we continue in this love until the end and to eternity? How do we get this love when we're sinful, selfish, carnal human beings that need to be completely transformed? That's a fair question, isn't it? Because can we continue living in sins regardless how small they are, or can we continue in a layer to see in a lukewarm condition and expect to be with the Lord for eternity? I mean, those are questions we have to ask. Could it be that maybe we're being deceived if we're that complacent with the Lord? The answer lies in Hebrews 12, 2, and 3, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. So here's four things we cannot look at. If we have to look up at Christ, these are four things. And these are four things that um, carnal nature and the devil tends to make us chase at times um, because we're emotional beings. But we have to get to the point where we're so filled with the Spirit that our mind controls our emotions. First, we can't look within. All you see when we look in is guilt, shame, condemnation, failure, disappointment. To focus on your behavior will pull you away and cause discouragement. Too focused on our behavior puts our eyes in the wrong direction. And believe me, uh, that is so true. And some of us, it may be more intense than others. But when a person with a rough background comes to the Lord and sees their need, and we uh, are going to see a lot of that. And by God's grace, we're going to see this church filled up this year. And a lot of that's going to be people have hard lives. People come from all types of addiction, sexual abuse, all types of stuff. And if Satan has them to continue to look within themselves and stuff, they're not going to see any good. They're going to be discouraged. And no matter what we try to tell them about the Lord, it just won't matter. Second, we don't look around you. We can't put confidence in those around us. This includes our leaders. We're all human, and when one looks uh, up at a leader, uh, and that leader falls, it, it breaks our spirit, and it can cause people to leave the church. And I've known several who have done that, and we, we see that. It's... It can get you in the wrong path. So we look up to Christ, and we need to be like the Bereans. Go home and check everything out. Don't look back behind you. You cannot run a race looking behind you. You will find nothing but discouragement and defeat. You win by keeping your eye on the prize. And we don't need to look too far ahead. We don't know if we're going to see you tomorrow, right? And when we say we worry, what we're really saying is, I'm not trusting you, God. I mean, we need to be honest. Because if we trust in God, we don't worry. <laughs> we, we know it's assured. So if you, if you do, you will be prone to worry, get anxiety, be constantly worrying about the future, and we lose our joy. It robs us of our pleasure with the Lord. So look only up to Jesus. Keep your eyes on him, on his life, his death, his resurrection, and his high priest intercession. And so how do we look to Jesus? Because we need to know these things. If I want to be like Jesus, I want more of Jesus in me. I want to reflect God's character. Um, I need to know how to get there. And you know what's beautiful about Scripture? It is so simple. Salvation is so simple. It's very deep, but it's so simple. Uh, God, it's just a beautiful thing. It only gets better and better as we continue to study and pray. Hebrews 2.9, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for whom? How many? Every man. That's you and me. When you look at the cross, see that he tasted death for everyone. See a Jesus who took your shame, your condemnation, your past, put whatever you want to put in there. He took it all. 
and look at Jesus who stopped at nothing to save you. I forgive you. Throw it away. Don't look back. It's over. It's history. Jesus cares about our future. He's not caring about our past. He cares about our future. Do you agree? And that's what we should care about. The future is what we have. That's our hope. Moment by moment, day by day, meditate on his love for you and the sacrifices and gifts he has given you. And we have many, many of them. We talk about that in prayer meeting a lot, uh, the blessings that God, for us who are blessed uh, to have eyesight, ears, we see sunsets, loved ones, and so many people in the world have not had that. We have a lot to be thankful for. In Sutherland, tons of things to be thankful for. I mean, we're fairly new here, so I can say that. Some of you might be complacent, but this is really a great area, uh, more than you might realize. And if you don't think so, just get out and about for a while. Uh, I'll take you to a couple of places back east, and you'll be happy to get back here. <laughs> Hebrews 3.1, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Look beyond the cross to where Jesus is now and what he is still doing for you. It's ongoing. Our relation with him only stops when we stop. He's not only your dying Lord, but your living Savior. You can say amen to that, right? He is our living Savior. He's not dead. He's alive and still our high priest. Look up at Jesus. He is our treasure of the gospel. He is able to save. Hebrews, wherefore he is able also to save to them the uttermost that come unto him, unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Those are promises. His grace is greater than your sin. We can say hallelujah to that one. God's grace, and that's Bible, it's not Mike. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Look up at Jesus. We need to get that in our heads. We need to know that Jesus is our life. It's so important for our salvation. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Look up at Jesus. He's our treasure of the gospel. It's, it's simple. Sin, yours and mine, crushed out his life. Meditate on these things for a while. Let us not just hear nice things about Jesus, but think about what that is. Personalize it. Because we can't save each other. Uh, my relationship with Christ is personal. You can encourage me or discourage me, um, but it's still a personal relationship that I have to have with Christ. Look up at Jesus. He was willing and he proved. And it's accomplished fact, isn't it? We know he lived, he died, was resurrected, and now uh, in the heavenly sanctuary is still doing a work on our behalf. But that's going to be ending soon. So the question again is, um, am I ready? Am I a wise virgin? Foolish. Do I have that oil in my lamp? Because the oil is what's going to fill me up with Christ. I'm going to have Christ's character. He give up his life and the possibility of ever being with his Father again so that you and I could be. I don't know how to put that in human terms. Us who have children, it would be like saying if we've seen Saddam Hussein when he was alive or something, and I was willing to take one of my kids and kill him so Saddam could have a chance. And I don't know if he's going to accept it, but I'm going to kill my son. Uh, I mean, I don't know any other way to, to try to grasp what God did for us. But if we can grasp that and appreciate that, um, We'll fall in love with a beautiful God. He was willing to trade his eternity for us to have eternity. Look up at Jesus. He's our treasure of the gospel. Look up to Jesus, our treasure of the gospel, and all the power of heaven is working on your behalf, all because of what Jesus has done and is continuing to do. Do you realize that when you pray, you give God permission to move all of heaven on your behalf? Unbelievable. And think of the promise. I mean, uh, we need to have some testimonial Sabbaths and stuff and, uh, so that we know that this Bible is alive. It's not just a bunch of words. It's, it's true. When you look up at Jesus, you'll see God's love, his righteousness, his strength, hope, courage, a bright future, and a burden for souls. Now, that last one, when we look at 
we have to ask ourselves, do I really have a burden for souls? And that's, so, that's personal. We have to ask ourselves because if we say amen to all of that, but I don't have a burden for souls, then I maybe need to question what kind of virgin am I? Am I wise or foolish? Because if we're Christians and we realize what God has done for us, and we see people perishing, and we understand that God loves them as much as me. And he says, Mike, I want you to, to do whatever you can to help win souls to the kingdom. I should have that burden because we want a large family. There's nobody in here that I, I hope nobody in here is wishing that somebody here doesn't go to heaven. We all want to be there, don't we? We've got to be an earthly family to be a heavenly family. Through the power of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is the oil. This is connecting to the wise and foolish We'll see some power that's in there. But through the power of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that's the oil, we will be able to continue to look up at Jesus and have his power to overcome. Remember, it's Christ's righteousness. It's what Christ has accomplished for us. We have to have the faith of Jesus, not just the faith in Jesus, but the faith of Jesus. Because when Christ is in us, he fights the battle. How many of us keep trying to be good or, or overcome things and stuff? That's because we're trying on our own. We're not getting what Jesus already done for us. We need to let it go and keep inviting the Holy Spirit. And, and we will be transformed. That's a promise. His power to win souls, his power to discern, to become like him. The Holy Spirit in us, that's the oil, will keep our eyes where they should be. And it's only through sincere, earnest, agonizing prayer that self will be emptied and replaced by the Spirit of God. It really is that simple. And God gave us a great commission, but he gave us the power to achieve that commission. We are to have true love and be true Christians and be a witness to all the world. And we all have a part now. You've heard me say it over and over. It doesn't matter what part. When you have a sincere obligation, we are a Christian army. Do you agree? And an army has all types of people in it. It has commanders, frontline people, behind the scenes people. It's all important. Frontline soldiers are dead if they don't have supply clerks that know how to get ammunition to the front lines. We need us all. Don't let Satan think that your job is just, I'm just a greeter or I'm just, a, that's Satan. That's not the Lord. The heart of the true Christian is imbued with true love with the most earnest hunger for souls. So again, we have to ask ourselves, if I don't have that, then that's an indicator I need to seek more of Jesus because we need to have that in there. He has that for us. He is not at rest until he is doing all that is in his power to seek and to save that which is lost. Serious thoughts. Time and strength are spent. Toilsome work is not shunned. Others must be given the truth which is brought to his own soul. Such gladness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That oil keeps showing up. Show them our treasure of the gospel. That's all the Lord does. Divine love makes it most touching appeals to the heart when it calls upon us to manifest, make known, the same tender compassion that Christ manifested. The true Christian will not willingly permit the soul in peril and need to go unwarned, uncared for. True love is a high and holy principle, altogether different in character from that love which is awakened by impulse, which suddenly dies when severely tested. It's only by obtaining the fullness of the Holy Spirit that in that oil, we see that, that we can have more of Christ in us and reflect our Lord and Savior to the world. And only sincere prayer can bring this about. And there's no shortcuts, brothers and sisters. We all get there the same way. We can't buy our way. It's the same way. We need to see our need. Remember in Psalm 51 when David was crying out, create me a clean heart, renew a right spirit within me. You go down to, I think, verse 17. It says the sacrifice that God wants is a broken spirit and a contrite heart. Because that means we see our need for him, and that contrite means collapse. And so we have nowhere to look but up. And then we're teachable. Since this is the means, speaking of the Holy Spirit, which we are to receive power, why do we not hunger and thirst for the gift of the Spirit? Why do we not talk of it, pray for it, and preach concerning it? For the daily baptism of the Spirit, every worker should offer his petition to God. Companies of Christians, Christian workers, should gather to ask for special help. So we should be having little groups in our home, and these are prayer meetings. Or there's, we're to come together. We're to have closet prayers. 
But we need to be seeking for heavenly wisdom that they know how to plan and execute wisely. The presence of the Spirit with God's workers will give proclamation of truth, the power that not all the honor or glory of the world could give. That's the oil in us. Getting to closing here, he who does not love does not know God, for God is love, right? A love beyond, uh, like I say, I'm unfit to teach. And, uh, how do you explain that depth of love? I can only tell you what God has done for me. Uh, believe me, he's taken my past, he's taken a lot of lemons, and he gave me a pitcher of lemonade. So all I can do is praise him for, he just has ways to, Fix some messes in life, doesn't he? What a wonderful God. One of the most beautiful scriptures in 1 Corinthians. And now abides faith, hope, and charity. And that charity is that agape love we talked about earlier. These three, but the greatest of these is what? The greatest of these is what? Charity. Unselfish love. And why is that? When we look at that scripture... When Jesus Christ comes to take home his faithful followers, I don't have to hope anymore and have faith that he's going to do that. But I need to have his character of love because if I don't have his character of love or a heart after that character of love, I'm not reflecting Christ and I'm not safe for heaven. I think that's a, a pretty serious uh, scripture. But it's a message of love. And so closing, today and every day, let's look up at Jesus. And daily seek the comforter that was promised, our treasure of the gospel. Let us not be found wanting. Let us not be foolish virgins. Let us be honest. And I don't know about you, it's not always comfortable to be honest when you have to look at stuff and you think you've been right for so long and the Lord starts pointing out things. But I have to ask myself, how much effort have I made to win souls to the Christ? What part have I played in the church to help win souls for the Christ? Or have I hindered people or have I criticized people and cut people down and trying to turn brethren against brethren and just uh, making a mess out of things? Do I work for the devil or do I work for Christ? It's pretty simple, right? If I don't work for the Lord, if I don't seek the Lord with all my heart, I get the devil by default. Do you agree? I mean, there's, I don't know nothing in between. So let us uh, continue to pray. You know, no matter how big a church is, there's hurting souls in a church. There's people who still let their past haunt them. The guilt comes in. I want to submit to you today, if anybody has that in their heart here today, let it go today. Grasp the love of the Lord. He doesn't care about your past. It's history. It's over. We need to learn from it. Look to the future. Become a true disciple of the Lord. Thank you. Father, we pray that we will take this message to heart. We pray that we will, by your grace, understand the magnitude of your love for us. Amen and what it is that you wish us to pass on to others around us. Might we have a better understanding, might we have more discernment when it comes to understanding love and how your will is to be embedded in, our, in the fabric of our souls, Father. And now as we go about our duties this week, we pray that we will be shining lights and the Oil will shine through us, Father, so that uh, we can soon be in heaven with you. We ask this, Father, in Christ's name. Amen.